Hello, hello, hello. This is Tisky, and uh, today we'll be playing another entry of the Winter VN Game Jam. Today we'll be playing Yearning for Spring, which you can play on chasecubed.itch.io. Before we begin, I'm going to read the uh, itch.io uh, main page. The game summary. Warm layers for snow? Check. Granola bars? Check. Cocoa mix? Check. A big gay heart ready for love? Check. B. A city girl who loves snow goes on vacation to a snowy mountain to hike the trails and soak in the serene late winter landscape. She meets Camil Camellia, a regal woman with an air of mystery, when she wanders off the trail. What can with the summary read, let's get started. Also, please let me know if the sound levels are good. A large, beat-up SUV pulls up into a deserted parking lot. Its chain tires crunch against the salted asphalt loudly. It finds its resting place in one of the many open spots, though whomever is driving probably could have parked horizontally across, the, across several spots and no one would be any the wiser. I like the art. There was a brief moment of silence before the driver door swung open with a creak. With a not so graceful hop and stumble from the height of the vehicle, the woman braces herself against the car door. B. I should really get that step installed. She huffed at her past self for putting off such a simple thing, but then shrugged it off, smiling. Ah, made it. And the whole place to myself, too, from the looks of it. She beamed, noting the empty lot, the snow-topped trees, and the crisp air. She felt invigorated and ready for her adventure. She rustled through her back seat, pulling out a hiking backpack that was nearly as large as she was. She had planned the whole day out. Hiking, lunch, then more hiking, small snack break, then hiking back to the start. It was going to be her first snow hike in years. Hiking has been a much-loved pastime for her these last few years. She grew up in the snow and got her love of the outdoors from hiking the snowy trails of her hometown. The snow was like an old friend, and she missed it dearly. Her hand hesitated for her flaming hot crisps that lay half-consumed in the passenger seat from her pit stop earlier in the morning but she thought better of it and grabbed the beef jerky and a couple hot cocoa packets, just in case. You know, emergency supplies, duh. She may have been a hot cocoa junkie, but that wasn't something she was ready to admit. She grabbed a couple more items to shove into the already over-capacity bag before slamming her car door shut and locking it with a beep of her key ring. She rubbed her hands together excitedly, then patted her chest. Under her sweater, she wore a necklace her mother gave her on a birthday. A small heart-shaped pendant, gold with a dainty chain. It remained polished from years of wear. Her mother had explained that it was hers, and her grandmother's, and her great-grandmother's, and then their great-great-aunts, and so on. It's been in the family for several generations now, and it was customary to pass it on to the daughter of the family. The necklace had always served as a good luck charm to be. It's been with her since she got it, and it was going to stay with her long, long after. After double-checking her necklace was on, she was ready. Do you ever think about that, about how some objects outlive generations? I do. Alrighty, let's go. 
She started the path, then stopped abruptly with a small panicked gasp. I locked my doors, right? Like, lock locked them? She spun around and beeped her key ring again, making the car respond with a beep and a blink of its lights. Phew, okay. Okay, I did. Cool, cool. With her worries put at ease, she spins back around, ready for her adventure again. The snowy, wooded hiking trail was untouched, a perfect, serene winter wonderland. A thin dusting of snow encrusted the leaves and blanketed the well-worn trail. This trail was very popular in the summer, but winter tended to clear the place out. It's interesting, we can see the, the, the entire character sprite. Normally in visual novels, the, you sometimes cannot see the legs, but here we can and the framing works, which is cool. I like the snow upon the trees. A thin dusting of snow encrusted the leaves and blanketed the well-worn trail. This trail was very popular in the summer, but winter tended to clear the place out. Bee had never understood that. It was a beautiful place. The variety of evergreens and redwoods that populated this forest were beautiful in the snow. Albeit it was, albeit it was late in the winter, she was lucky there was snow during her trip. But global warming or something, right? She shrugged at the thought. She was just happy she caught one of the last snows of the season. She looked up at the foliage that allowed rays of light to peek through the bands and beams. The warmth of the sunlight felt juxtaposed next to the cold enough to cloud next to air cold enough to cloud her breath. And yet, despite the cold, it felt like she was walking through an oil painting. I like that you can hear the birds in the distance. One of those oil paintings by the great masters of Impressionism and limited palettes. The monotonous white that covered the covered everything and yet hid a million different shades among its lights, shadows, and shapes. Everything blended together, but was easily differentiated as a stone or tree, vegetation or path. She tried taking pictures with her phone, but the images captured did the landscape little justice. This is what she gets for buying a cheap cell phone. B stretched out her arms, filled with giddy energy and skipped down the trail, kicking snow and giggling. She spotted a little snow hare that jumped away at her sudden loudness. Her eyes followed the hare until it disappeared into the white snow like a mirage. She pulled out one of her many snacks from her bag without taking it off, blindly feeling around the overstuffed bag before finding the one that felt right. The trail continues up a steep way that plateaus at 8,000 feet. At this height, she can see out just above the trees and can almost see the parking lot where she started, just a speck in the distance now. Had she really hiked that far away? She really underestimated herself this time. Maybe she could, she could go a bit further before heading back. She wondered wordlessly about what the end of the trail looked like. Would it lead all the way to the peak? She only really planned out the first eight-ish miles, and she was already going much quicker than anticipated. She shrugged. That was something to consider when she reached her destination. Along the plateau was a carved-out section that was used as a rest area, the snow-covered area made it look like it was actually part of the land, and not a man-made rest stop. Bee snapped her sternum strap and hip straps open, then swung the enormous pack to her front. She undid the drawstring top and rummaged through to pull out her small tarp for her picnic with nature. She glanced around the rest stop and had a thought. If she wanted to be in nature, she should be in nature, right? Not this man-made rest stop. 
She then had a second thought. That's how people get lost, like in those horror movies. She screwed her mouth and decided she would compromise with her anxiety. We'll just go a little outside the rest stop, a little. She stepped over the small rock barricade, a mere four-inch barrier, and felt a burst of giddy energy again. Just look at all the untouched snow, the trees with small icicles hanging off their needles, and icy trails nested in the park, park leading up the trunks of re the redwoods. She felt her feet moving forward without thinking. She was completely enraptured. The powdered snow barely made a sound as it gave away under her, her boot. The light sparked and danced off the snow-covered landscape, almost like fairies mesmerizing her. She finally blinked, breaking the spell. How long had she walked? What was she thinking? She turned her around and found she could no longer see the rest stop. Gah! I knew, I knew this would happen. Why couldn't I just sit at the rest stop, hmm? She kicked the powdered snow. Okay, okay, breathe. She did a calming breath motion with her arms. We'll just follow my footsteps, right? It'll be fine. She about faced and started to move her steps back, stepping in each imprint just to be sure. She walked and walked. But that wasn't right. She couldn't have walked that far, could she? She kept walking. What was this? Something is off. I passed this tree before. This stone looks the same. No way. Ugh. <laughs> she lets out a gravelly grunt of frustration. B planted her feet, then hugged her knees, shoving her face against them. There's no way she could be lost. She only went it in a straight line, right? This is ridiculous. Not to mention the afternoon fog was rolling in and it was starting to get colder. The forecast didn't say anything about a storm. With her luck, she guessed. B could feel dread creeping into her chest, squeezing her heart. She breathed and pushed it back down. There's no reason to panic. Just get up and keep walking. It's all I can do right now. Keep walking. She hugged herself for warmth and continued to follow her footprints. The wind whipped up, making it harder to see and It wasn't long before it became apparent she was walking into a blizzard. She needed to move faster, faster. Her steady pace became a jog and then a blind sprint as she protected her eyes from the ice laced winds that buffeted her, buffeted her. She ran and ran and ran. How long had she been running for? How long should she keep up this pace? Her breath became ragged. She knew she needed to keep going, but it was dangerous to keep pushing herself, especially in temperatures this low. She could already feel her airways getting irritated and inflamed. She needed face covering for protection. Did she remember her neck gaiter? Did she bring her emergency flares? Her thoughts braced as the snow became deeper and deeper. Her sprint became a slog through calf-high snow. She could feel the snow getting into her boots and the beginnings of discomfort of wet sock. Some, ooh, that's bright. Something unseen hooked her boot and she fell face first. Um, Uh-oh, what did I press? Oh, what did I press? Mm -hmm. 
I accidentally um, uh, pressed the key to make it full screen and then when I went out of full screen the screen went funny. It got a bit peculiar so I'm just going to reopen it. Hang on. Please stand by. Ah, there we go. I fixed it. It was probably the, um, I think it was the, the screen capture going a bit peculiar suddenly after I, I clicked um, full screen mode. Her thoughts raced as the snow became deeper and deeper. Her sprint became a slog through calf high snow. She could feel the snow getting into her boots and the beginnings of the discomfort of wet sock. Something unseen hooked her boot and she fell face first into the newly piled powder. She wanted to cry. This was supposed to be her day. Her escape from the real world for a day or two. It was supposed to be a stress-free adventure into the solitude of nature. She dropped, she propped herself up and threw off her pack and collapsed on her back. She realized then that the blizzard had stopped. The wind had died down and it was just gently snowing now. Oof. She let out a long sigh of frustration, layered with an overtone of expletives. She closed her eyes and scrunched her face. Her face was red from the cold, or was it anger? First I get lost going in a straight path in a forest, then a freak blizzard? Her words ring hollowly in the now silent serenity of the wooded snowscape. She suddenly became aware her hands were chilled to the bone. Stiff and red, but no signs of frost nip yet. B cupped her hands and breathed into them, humming a little melody that sounded vaguely like a popular video game theme. She gasped as she thought of her necklace and patted her chest with a tad too much force. She felt it right where it should be. She sighed again, this time more calmly. Might as well make a snow angel. B thought as she flung her arms back out to the snow. She lay there for a minute longer, wondering what her fate will be. Her tracks have completely covered have been completely covered by the new laid snow, and she lost all orientation. She resigned herself to a long hike in one direction to find her way back to civilization and maybe even her car. Hopefully no more freak blizzards. B propped herself back up to her knees to rummage through her pack for her gloves when something at the corner of her vision caught her attention. Oop, hang on. Where is the moderate button? Hang on. Do I right click on this? Wait, hang on.
spam with link in message. Apologies for the delay. I, I had to block someone because um, they were sending spammy links in the chat. We shall continue now. B propped herself back up to her knees to rummage through her pack for her gloves when something at the corner of her vision caught her attention. A girl? She squinted and blinked, trying to focus on what she thought she saw. Forgetting about her search for her gloves for the moment, she swung her pack back on and rushed to get closer to what she saw. A girl! Hi Cryo, how are you? Welcome to the stream. With each step it became more apparent that what she saw was not a girl, but a woman dressed in pale clothes, with pale hair, and skin nearly as pale as the like it was carved from alabaster and glazed in porcelain. She shimmered among the snowscape as if part of it. Uh, Cryo says, Hi, I'm good. I hope you're good too. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, we're having a chill stream of yearning for spring. I'm enjoying it so far. It's intriguing. B found herself hiding behind a tree, unsure of herself. What was she seeing? What was she doing out here? Were they lost like she was? Is this her property? She was beautiful, breathtakingly so. B could almost see the air sparkling around her. Her movement seemed to move the snow, or rather, what was her clothing? It must just it must be just a trick of the eye, right? B hesitated only a moment longer before approaching the strange woman. With careful steps, she walked closer to her, calling out. H hello there. Ah, Slippery. D do you happen to live here? She seemed to have gotten... I seem to have gotten myself lost and... Oh my, do I, you need a jacket? You must be freezing. Oh, um, here, please take... Ah! B had all, another misstep and plummeted to where the woman stood. Embarrassed and rubbing her hip, B stood up quickly and offered her windbreaker to the woman with an outstretched arm. The icy figure started stared down at B. She was pretty much taller than B realized and towered her over with a glowering stare. There was a long moment of silence before B made a small movement with the jacket saying she insisted, but the woman did, still did not move to take it. B slowly lowered her arm. O or, if you're worried that it's not clean, I have a tarp blanket that's sealed in my bag. B smiled and motioned to her pack. I um also have cocoa. Uh, we find another... Uh, if we find a place to make it and boil some... Um, water. B slowly remembered they're in the middle of nowhere, and she did not bring her camping supplies. I mean, I did, but they're in the car. She silently curses her over-preparedness and simultaneous under-preparedness. How, how did I know I'd get turned around in and get lost on a straightforward trail in a forest, then encounter a freak blizzard, and then encounter a a similarly lost person in the forest. She rubs her forehead with the fist, caught up in her own thoughts again, not realizing the woman had reached an arm out to her. Huh? Oh, oh, y yes, of course. B hands her jacket over to the woman, who drapes it over her shoulders with a coy smile. B finds her face heating up. Whoa. She says it so quietly. She barely hears it herself, but covers her mouth anyways to prevent anything else from spilling out. She's gorgeous. The silent admission was enough to send a giddy flutter through her heart. The woman gives B a nod and then finally speaks. Thank you. 
Her voice was like ice cubes clinking in a glass or a thin sheet of ice, splitting quietly. It sent a chill down Bee's spine. You're welcome. Bee smiled timidly before the cold reminded her yet again they were stranded. So, do you, uh, live around here? The woman smiled again, but it was more of an off-centered smirk, like a crooked smile. Yes, you could say that. Oh, that's wonderful. Would you be okay if I went to your house and used your phone? Bee reached out and grabbed her hand, walking in the direction they were facing. Oh, I do not have a, a house. Bee stopped to absorb what she said. So you're lost just like me? N no. The woman seemed confused, which made Bee even more confused. Do you know where we are then? Could you lead me back to the trail, or better yet, the parking lot? Uh, uh, well, the woman thought and looked around confused. I've never really thought of where here is. Her thin voice trailed off. V was starting to become genuinely worried. She could feel her fear start to creep in, but she pushed it down with a deep breath. Okay, well, let's just choose a direction and walk. Does that sound good? The woman still looked confused, but the warmth of Bee's hand in hers felt nice. She nodded and allowed Bee to lead her in an arbitrary direction. They walked for a while in silence, with only the sound of the snow crunching beneath their feet to fill the void. Bee glanced back occasionally to make sure she was okay and saw that she was staring, unwaver staring unwaveringly directly at her. B quickly looked back ahead, her cheeks flushed. Was there something on her face? Why was she staring at her with such intensity? So, uh, her voice was much louder than she anticipated. She cleared her throat and then started over, much more quietly. So, what's, uh, what's your name? B chanced a, a quick glance back with a smile. The woman was still staring intently at B but then blinked at the question. She thought for a moment, then quietly said, Camellia. Camellia? Like the flower? Camellia nodded, just like the flower. I'm Beatrice, but you can just call me Bee. Bee turned back again and smiled. All my friends call me Bee. Friends. Acknowledgement. There was another silent moment before B spoke again. Hey, Camellia, have you ever had hot chocolate? Camellia shook her head. Um, no? B was shocked. She spun around and threw up her hands, letting go of Camellia's. What? Oh man, it's the greatest thing ever. Wait, Coco? Have you ever heard of Coco? Camellia shook her head again, though this time she looked slightly amused. B is passionate about her hot chocolate and cocoa. She was holding her beanie, still shocked. Gah, okay. Once we're out of here, we need to fix that, okay? I know a good place in the city. B had turned back around, still holding her hand, like she couldn't shake that someone had never had this gloriousness in a cup before. And this place uses all three types of chocolate. Can you believe that? White milk and... White milk and dark. It has such a balanced recipe, and then they top it off with a piece of ruby chocolate as the starter, and ah, it's so good. B trailed off about her favorite recipe as she trudged on leaving Camellia to ponder the warmth left on her hand. She raised it to her cheek. It was a sensation she wasn't much familiar with. It, it made her happy. Camellia could feel the edges of her mouth turning upward into a smile. She glanced back when Camellia didn't... V glanced back when Camellia didn't answer one of her various follow-up questions and realized Camellia wasn't directly behind her. V looked around wildly before finding Camellia exactly where she was last standing. Carefully, V jogged back to Camellia. Are you okay? Are you tired? Nah. Well, we can rest if you need to. Bee put a hand on Camellia's forearm gingerly and was shocked to find her so cold. 
like ice. Oh, we need to get you indoors. No wonder you're not moving so well. V looks around the barren forest wildly. This isn't good. When hypothermia sets in like this, we need... Ah. Gah, I wish there was some place we could make cocoa. Camellia stared down blankly at the small panicking V. The wind began to whip up again. Oh no, not another freaking blizzard, please. As if to scorn bees, please, the wind became stronger, driving them in a different direction as before. Camellia reached out and grabbed Bee's hand. Bee held it tightly as she shielded her eyes with her free hand. They walked blindly for what felt like ages before stumbling into a clearing. The blizzard was picking up even stronger now, with the winds howled through the tr how through howling through the trees. Bee slips, but is caught by Camellia. Her hand was surprisingly steady. Bee went to thank her, but stopped something but spotted something in the distance. No way. Is that a cabin? Bee couldn't believe her luck today. Her mix of fortune and misfortune was enough to make her head spin. But she didn't have time to explain to Camellia, or contemplate her cosmic karma. She needed to get to the structure she could barely make out on the other side of the clearing. Pulling Camellia along, Bee fought her way through the snow and up the steps of the cabin door. B pulled the door open. Luckily it was unlocked and motioned Camellia in. Her entire weight to pull the door closed against the blizzard wind. Using her entire weight to pull the door closed against the blizzard wind, B fell backwards onto the wooden floor, breathing hard in the still cabin air. Everything was still and quiet, except for the wind rustling through the cracks in the door. B lies on her back, taking in everything that has happened today. She had a day like today on her bucket list, hiking this mountain trail and staying in the wood in, the, in a snow-crested cabin with a beautiful woman, that is. Not getting lost in the woods and being trapped in a snow, snowed-in cabin in the woods. B turned her attention back to the present and looked up at Camellia. A mirthful smile played on B's lips. Oh, hey, fancy meeting you here. Camellia stares at B and blinks slowly. We came in together. Oh, I, uh... B looks away, embarrassed, and hurriedly gets up. I... never mind. <laughs> let's... J let's see what's in here. B busies herself with unpacking her rucksack and goes through the cupboards. Camellia looks around the room, then after removing her coat, sits at one of the wooden chairs at the small table. It's a small cabin, with just enough space to move around each piece of furniture. There's a small sofa, and a, a square table just large enough for two, and two chairs. There is also a wood fire pot-bellied stove, and a couple freestanding hutches with cupboards that had, strangely stocked, had a strangely stocked supply of plates and mugs. B pulled out the last of her supplies and took account of how long they could get by on what she had packed. She had a good amount of snacks, but what really worried her was how long they could last on the water she had. She can canvassed the cabin and found a small sink with running water that con connected to a very small bathroom. B ran the water and luckily it hadn't frozen. A big smile split her serious expression in two. Eureka! Where's that? No, what? It's just a phrase. I just mean we have running water. That's good. Bee's big smile made Camellia smile a little. Mm-hmm. Do you know what that means? We will not die of dehydration? No, I mean, yes. I mean, it means I can make you cocoa. Bee almost skipped to her bag. She was still shivering from the cold and the fact that her clothes were very nearly soaked through, so she couldn't really skip. First things first, though, fire. Camellia looked through the contents of Bee's pack as Bee gathered the wood and attempted to start a fire. 
physical exertion from starting the fire was good, as it warmed up Bee's freezing body. She didn't need to worry so much about Camellia's hypothermia if she succumbed to it first. As Bee works to start a fire in the small wood burning stove, she can't help but feel like she's being watched. Which, which makes sense, really. There's another person here with nothing better to do than to, to watch her. But still, the feeling of Camellia's stare runs a shiver up and down her spine. She worked the little ember she got and nursed it until it became a flame. She built a small tent of wood around it and watched her hands until it became self-sufficient enough she could close the stove door. She grabbed the kettle and put some water on to boil. Then she sat in the free chair across from Camellia. We felt so much colder sitting away from the stove. She almost regretted moving away from it, but also didn't want Camellia to feel lonely. They couldn't really think anymore. Her thoughts were muddled between survival adrenaline and trying to seem composed in front of Camellia. Not that she was trying to impress her, but more to help her feel safe. Camellia, however, didn't seem all that at all phased. She looked comfortable, despite it still being near freezing temperatures within the cabin. Bee blinked slowly. Camellia almost felt like a vision. She shimmered and sparkled and phased in and out of focus with the motes of dust that floated in the cabin air. Bee rubbed her eyes. Darn, she was tired. She tried to perk herself up by trying out some conversation. Hey, um, Camellia? Her words came out slow. Her mouth felt like cotton, and swallowing was hard. V cleared her throat and tried again. Um, Camellia? Are you alright? V's attention snaps back into focus. Her head had lulled forward. She rubs her face, throws off her jacket, and gets up to check the water and fire. The water was warm. The fire is still going. She wasn't out for more than a minute. B continues to watch the water as the heat warms her again frigid body. Camellia? Yeah? I'm excited to make this cocoa for you. Aw. Camellia felt something in her stomach move, or flutter? She wasn't sure what to call this feeling. I am intrigued to try it. She felt herself smile. She hadn't felt... she felt a little goofy or loopy. She was pretty sure half of this cocoa was a hallucination, but hey, if she was hallucinating, it might as well be making cocoa. She finally started seeing bubbles form at the bottom of the kettle and shuffled over to the nearest hutch to pull out some mugs. She emptied a cocoa packet into each, then poured it in the freshly boiled water. She gingerly walked the piping hot cocoa over to the table and slid one mug over to Camellia, who looked at it intrigued. V cupped her mug and let the heat radiate up her arms. Camellia hesitantly reached toward the mug, then gasped, pulling her hand back quickly. Ah, I'm sorry, it's very hot. Please let it cool a little. Your hands must be freezing, so it'll definitely hurt as they warm up again. Camellia nodded and watched Bee as she blew on her cocoa. Camellia leaned over her mug and blew softly, mimicking Bee. Whoops, I clicked too soon. Mimicking Bee with her own drink. She reached out again and touched the mug much more comfortably this time. Bee watched with interest as Camellia held the mug, then took a sip. Was she going to like it? Bee blew on her cocoa again and took a sip, closing her eyes to cherish the comforting warmth and, and flavor. Bee opened her eyes again to find that Camellia had emptied her mug. Bee leaned over to make sure, but yeah, Camellia had already drank the whole mug full. Wow, how did... It was good, the flavor, very, um, flavorful. Bee snorted and had to put her cup down. She erupted with giggles as Camellia stared on. I I'm sorry. <laughs> I just... I've never had that someone... 
respond that way. B couldn't hold herself together. She laughed until she had stitches and then tried to calm herself with a couple deep breaths. Ooh, phew, oh my, I think I needed that laugh. B looked up at Camellia with her big smile again. I'm very happy you enjoyed it. Camellia smiled. She was also happy she enjoyed it. The heat the drink left reminded her of Bee's warm, warm hand in hers. Thank you for sharing. Camellia, Camellia's smile sent Bee's heart and stomach a flutter. Her cheeks felt warm again. N no problem, haha. <laughs> Bee stood up abruptly to collect the mugs and feed the fire, but Camellia grabbed her hand. The warmth from the cocoa just lingered still in Bee's hands while Camellia's hands were already cold. She longed for warmth in her own again. Are you okay? I, um... Camellia didn't know what to say. It was not in her nature to talk unless she had something to say. So what was she trying to say? She paused, searching for that reason. Do you have more cocoa? Bee smiled. Yeah, only one more packet, though. Would you like it? Camellia nodded. No problem, then. B smiled and shimmied back over to the stove with the mugs. Within minutes, B had made the new mug of cocoa and Camellia had drank it while B snapped on a trail mix bar. This is making me hungry for cocoa. I, I'm gonna get one after this. I'm so glad you like the cocoa. I could feel the embarrassment from asking for another cup starting to creep in. She felt guilty. I'm sorry for drinking your last cocoa. Oh, it's okay. I get to have co cocoa all the time. It's only fair I share my goodies with someone who's never had it. I, I suppose. Camellia didn't like this feeling. It didn't sit well with her. Hey, I promise, okay? B smiled at Camellia and held out a pinky. Okay, but what's that gesture? Ah, it's for a pinky promise. Pinky promise? Strongest promise in all the world. It means I cannot break my promise and a pinky promise to you that giving you my last cocoa was because I wanted you to have it, okay? Camellia nodded and held out her pinky too, mirroring B. B then leaned forward, hooking Camellia's pinky in hers. Pinky swear, the promise has been sealed. Camellia's eyes seemed to sparkle. Pinky swear, the promise has been sealed. Camellia repeated it quietly. B giggled softly as she took away the mug and trash. B was feeling really sleepy again, but at least dry this time. The potbelly stove was heating up the cabin nicely, and she was finally able to shed her layers comfortably. We should figure out sleeping arrangements. B's voice trailed off as she realized the sofa was quite small. Sleeping? Are you tired? No. Camellia said it slowly. It was the truth, and B seemed quite tired despite her upbeat attitude. Well, are you sure? I don't want you to feel obligated. B had straightened up from checking on the fire and suddenly felt very woozy. She stumbled back and gripped the back of her of the sofa. Camellia could feel her feet move before she knew what, what she was doing. She held B up, keeping her from falling over. Camellia led her to the sofa and reluctantly let go of her. Sleep? Now? Camellia's words sounded more like questions to Bee than actual commands, but Bee, were... Bee could feel the heat from the stove em... em... emitating. She was comfortable, and she fell asleep as soon as her body hit the sofa. Camellia stood there for a moment before beginning to pace. Time felt endless. The cabin seemed to move around her. It was like she glided through space, allowing it to pass beneath her. She lifted Bee's coat off the back of the chair and held it to her chest. It must be real. This jacket is real, after all. Camellia stared at Bee's body on the sofa. Limp, warm, 
defenseless. Camellia could feel her longing to feel Bee's skin beneath her fingers again, to hold her hand to her cheek. She held the jacket to her face and breathed in the smell of the woods, of the snow that dampened it, of the artificial fibers it was made of, of the manufactured snacks it was surrounded by, of the organic smell of bee that just barely lingered. Camellia sat back down in the chair at the table and laid her head in her arms, with the jacket as a cushion. She slowly blinked, her eyes still trained on bee. What is so interesting about her? Why is her warmth so alluring? Camellia closes her eyes, letting her questions consume her. Bee's heart was beating fast. She could barely breathe. How far did she have to run to shake this phantom? She heaved, then continued charging ahead double time, quickly glancing backwards. The two glowing eyes that had been slowly following her every move continued to gain on her despite her quickened pace. Slowly, inevitably, they encroached on the ground she was put she had been put between them. She fell into her she fell to her trembling knees, unable to force them to go any further. And the eyes, they kept coming closer and closer. B woke the next morning to an unfamiliar to an unfamiliar ceiling atop an unfamiliar and lumpy sofa. Where in the world? She blinked slowly. The image of the red glowing eyes, ever following, still haunted her vision. Then the soreness in her neck and legs pushed the memories to the surface. The hike, the blizzard, the cabin, the cocoa, the beautiful woman who shared all of these with her. Camellia's brushed, blushed lips and Dazzling eyes teased her imagination. Her pale blonde hair, like etched marble, framed her face perfectly. The cool touch of her hand in hers. It definitely wasn't a dream. With the image of Camellia firmly in her mind's eye, Bee bolts upright and looks around until she spots the woman standing barefoot in front of the stove. Without caring for the harsh predicament she found herself, she swiftly said a quick thank you to whatever entity had led her to this point. She couldn't decide if she was the luckiest person ever or the most unlucky. Wait, what am I saying? We're trapped here. I'm gonna have a drink, hang on. Ah, oh, that's better. She slowly and quietly sat up, wanting to observe Camellia for a few more moments. It was then that she realized that Camellia appeared tense. Her shoulders were set in such a way as to express a great deal of confusion and frustration. Come on, you. Just do this one thing for me. You've no qualms about setting my forest ablaze, but you won't light just this small bit of wood so I can try to... What is it they call it again? Cook? Who, um, who are you talking to? Amelia spun around with a start. Oh, um, not a person, just myself. A small blush crept across Camellia's face as she tried desperately to appear as though everything had been going exactly according to, pl to plan. Of course, it hadn't been. She knows that. B probably knows too. Do you need help with that? That would be most kind. Camellia's face turned even redder as she accepted Bee's assistance. Bee rolled herself off the sofa with no semblance of grace or dexterity. She then bounced off the floor and was to Camellia's side in less than a few seconds. Oh, oh, I see. You're trying to relight the stove. I can do that for you. Don't worry. I'll take care of everything. As Bee got to work, Setting the wood inside the stove just so, Camellia couldn't help but be entranced. As Camellia watched, Bee's hands moved with precision and care. Within a few moments, she had a small fire lit. She tended to the fire with the hands of those who, who both love, loves the warmth and respects the dangers of the flame. Camellia was so lost in thought she didn't notice herself reach out timidly, 
As Bee's hands left the stove, Camellia's fingers brushed against Bee's delicately. Bee jumped, startled by the sudden contact. Oh, be careful. If you get too close, you'll get burned. Look. Bee held up the back of her hand to Camellia, and she could see that there were hairs that had been singed when the flame had turned suddenly. Camellia took the hand and looked closely, savoring once again the warmth of Bee's hands. She drew Bee's hand close to her cheek as if to wish away the harm that had befallen the girl. She opened her eyes and saw Bee look back at her with the blush and just a touch of confusion. Suddenly the moment was over and Camellia let Bee's hands hand go, self-conscious of her actions. What am I doing? She must think. Camellia's thoughts trailed off as she realized that Bee was talking to her. Um, so anyway, are you hungry? I think I saw some trail bars and dried fruit in my pack. If that's not what you want, perhaps there's, um, uh... B searched the tiny cabin for something other than her dry trail mix bars and dried fruit and her dry, dry granola. I wish there was something else to eat. She pouts, then suddenly something catches her eye. Was it a glare from... A reflection? A trick of the eye? Bee spins around and comes back to facing Camellia. Are you... are you okay? Bee furrows her brow, trying to understand something beyond her ca capacity. Bee? Camellia reaches out a hand hesitantly and Bee's eyes refocus. Oh, I'm sorry, what was I saying? Oh right, food. Then something draws her gaze to a wicker basket in the hutch behind Camellia. Bee steps forward and lowers Camellia's hand with both of hers. No, that wasn't... look. Bee says it softly with a single breath, wonder filled with this... filled with the single syllable. Camellia turns towards... towards the hutch and blinks. How did that get there? Camellia played with a puzzled expression. Bee shot a glance between Camellia and the basket and, the, and then decided to not question the unrivaled luck. Her stomach rumbles and cramps, reminding of the unprecedented amount of calories she burned yesterday. Bee clasps her hands. Well, anyhow, thank you, whoever was here before us. Bee moved the wicker basket to the table to unpack it. And laid out the supply, she put a hand to her chin thoughtfully. There were eggs, apples, breads. Any idea sprung to into her mind, and she started to rummage through the other hutches and cabinets looking for other items. She returned to the table with flour, sugar, spices, remarkably well-preserved items given this place seemed abandoned. The thought that this could actually be someone's home crossed her mind briefly, but so did the reminder that none of these supplies were here yesterday. Camellia sat at the table and curiously watched Bee unload ingredients and start an assembly line of mixing and whisking and melting and cooking. With minimal mess, Bee had whipped up scrambled eggs, toast, and pancakes for them to eat. Bee slid the plate stacked high with food onto the table and almost too excitedly slammed down two mugs of cocoa. I don't know how I missed this. There were several bags of cocoa in the hutch with the mugs. Miraculous, no? Oh, indeed. A mischievous grin played on Bee's lips as she exchanged looks with Camellia, who played meek. Was it luck? Magic? Serendipi serendipitous alignments? Did Camellia somehow go out into the storm and get these supplies? B wasn't sure. The questions would have would have to be for later. Now was about survival, and especially now was about eating this food that smelled so good. B took a couple timid bites. Somehow the eggs tasted like the most delicious egg she'd ever had, and the pancakes, even though she was missing some supplies, turned out perfectly, and the cocoa. The cocoa was perfect. Wow, I've never eaten something like this before. Do you like it? Absolutely. 
Camellia blew lightly on her steaming plate of food, then ate slowly as she listened to V talk. This is just something simple. Hope it tastes good. I wonder if it's just because I'm starved, but it came out amazing. Is it good? Bee's question had caught Camellia with her mouth full, so she nodded enthusiastically. Look at me now, eh, Mom? Bee puffed her chest proudly, hoping her thoughts can be channeled to her mother a thousand miles away. You see, my mom is an amazing chef and baker. She used to run her own bakery for a while, until she had me. But she never lost her passion for cooking and baking. She was the first person to introduce me to Coco. My mom must be someone you really look up to. I mean, yes? She did raise me. She also taught me to appreciate nature, which I think is what led me to my love of hiking and the outdoors. Bee's eyes sparkled as she talked about her passions. Camellia quietly nodded and urged on the one-sided conversation throughout their meal. Was Mom the one who gave you that as well? Camellia had spotted the gold heart-shaped necklace Bee wore. It glinted in the subtle light. Bee patted her chest to find it and fiddle with it. Oh yes, mm-hmm. I love it. It's been in our family for a long time. It's my favorite necklace. I can't remember the last time I took it off. Bee tucked her necklace back into her shirt to keep it safe. Family? Camellia wondered wordlessly. It wasn't until Bee had started to clean up that she realized she had dominated the majority of the late morning's, now late afternoon's, topics. On and on. Bee laughs nervously. The last thing you wanted was to make it seem like you only cared she only cared about herself. Please please, what are you passionate about? I do not have any passions. Bee paused midway to sink and spun around. To the sink and spun around. Th that's not right. I I mean I mean there must be something you enjoy doing, no? Camellia took a moment to think, to seriously consider if there was anything in her relatively short life she has enjoyed. Oh, I enjoy listening to you talk. She smiled that small reserve smile, and Bee felt her face become red hot. There was a moment of silence as Bee tried to recover her words. Bee does, is that not something I can enjoy? N no, no, you can enjoy that. Bee stiffly spun back to her. I'm gonna save again. She needed to calm down. Her knees had become jelly just hearing Camellia say those words. Her stomach was doing somersaults. Bee took a couple measured breaths and tried to casually saunter back over to the table. Camellia watched Bee's awkward strut and couldn't help but giggle ever so slightly. Bee? Yeah? Can we talk just a little more? I yeah. Bee slides back into her chair at the table, as gracefully as her wobbly legs would allow. She shifts in her seat, trying to get comfortable again. The cool blue light that lit the cabin through the single window warmed as the sun began to tilt into the afternoon hours. What can we talk about for a bit. We can talk about for a bit. Like, uh, tell me about yourself. I do not enjoy talking of myself. I would much prefer you talk. B wiggled in the chair again. I want to know more about you. B leans over the table and lightly touches Camellia's head. Where are you from? Do you have a middle name? O or last name for that? I want to... Please, B. I... Tell me about snow. Snow? You said you loved snow, right? I do, it's one of my favorite things in the world. I have a healthy respect for it, for its fierceness and its chill, and the ruthlessness that it can have. And I also love how it sparkles after a fresh powder blankets everything. I love the sound of the crunch when I walk in it. I love that it's a weather you can play with and build things out of. 
Camellia slowly interlaces her fingers in bees as she talks. When it snows, the landscape completely changes and new animals come and go. The snow is just, it's nature's paint, it's, it's chisel, and the land we inhabit is its humble canvas. Bee's eyes wander to the snow-packed window, and then back to Camellia's icy blue eyes. The snow is like your eyes, full of wonder and beauty. It was Camellia's turn to stiffen. A blush creeps into her cheeks, and she shifts in her chair, letting go of Bee's hand. Uh, I... Bee realizes the words she thought were only in her head, were in fact said aloud, and her blush deepens. Embarrassment grips her stomach, and she stands suddenly. I, uh, the wood is low. Bee paces the tiny cabin, searching for some extra wood, and then heads to the front door. But Bee, no, the blizzard, it's dangerous still. I'll be fine. She attempts to open the door, but it's like the door is shield sealed shut. She shoves it with all her weight and strength, and it barely budges an inch. Oh, hang on. Okay, we're back. Snow was packed heavily against the door and the wind howled to be let in. B, realizing her mistake, grip handle and pulled it shut again, sliding to the ground. She could